Hello, in this video we are going to give you an introduction to drug literature. Um, this content is taken from chapter 16 of your textbook. The objectives are also outlined at the beginning of the textbook, but briefly we're going to describe systematic approach for ser to searching for drug information, to explain the differences between primary, secondary, and tertiary literature, to discuss strengths and weaknesses of primary, secondary, and tertiary literature, to describe common and reputable sources of medical literature, to identify and appraise clinic pr clinical practice guidelines, to utilize common bibliographic databases to locate evidence, and to discuss ways to identify the quality of information found on the internet. So it's important as a healthcare provider and as a pharmacist that you know how to find information um, regarding medications and disease states that you can use to, in the treatment of your patients. So there are a couple different ways, things that you should know. So you need, sh need to know how to approach a request for information. You want to make sure that your approach is organized, logical, and efficient. You want to be able to know how to find and evaluate relevant literature, so really re relying and recognizing evidence-based medicine. And then also be able to assess and evaluate the impact this has on patient care. This is a nice um, figure from the textbook showing, kind of outlining the systematic approach to um, responding to a drug information request. So the first step, you get a drug information request from someone, you want to secure their requester's demographics. So who is it? What's their name? What's their position? Are they a physician, another pharmacist, a patient? Um, so, and then contact information, so email or phone. Um, the practice setting, the preferred route of follow-up, urgency, etc. Then you're going to obtain some background information from the requester to kind of find out is this a patient specific question or is this more general knowledge that they're asking for. If it's patient, if it's for a specific patient, then you're going to want to know um, additional information as needed. So age, height, weight, gender, other diseases, medications, etc. Um, then you're going to determine and categorize the ultimate question, so classifying the request. And um, this is important because it helps you to focus your search to specific resources. Um, and so one thing that you do with the request is you kind of try to identify what are some themes of the question. And these are some examples of different ways that you might classify a drug information request. Next, you're going to develop a search strategy and conduct a search for information. So you need to know where to begin searching and um, how what would be the best approach to search the literature so that you can get the most accurate and up-to-date information. Then once you have this information, you need to know how to evaluate, analyze, and synthesize the information. So identifying high-quality literature um, and then knowing what makes it high quality. So how do you know if this information is accurate? And we're going to learn more about this throughout the semester and get a lot more time um, practice with this. Um, next, you're going to formulate and provide a response. So you want it to be concise, professional, and if possible, tailor to the requester preferences, practice setting, and knowledge. Lastly, it's really important that you conduct a follow-up and documentation. So looking at the outcomes, impact of direct patient care, this really speaks to your credibility as a practitioner. And it's really important through all of these steps that you have appropriate documentation. And how you document and record this information might vary from site to site. So if you're in one hospital over another, they might have a different procedure. So it's important to ask about what the procedure is and make sure you follow that. So how do we judge the quality of medical literature? Well, there's some really kind of broad ways we might do this. So one might be, um, is this piece of information from a peer review source? So for instance, did I find a research article from a uh, scientific journal website? And when this article was submitted, did it undergo peer review? So was it sent out to other people with similar expertise in the field that could provide comment and um, assessment of the quality of this work? Or is this somebody, you know, information coming from some guy's blog where, you know, it's not getting input from necessarily experts. 
he still might be an expert, but without peer review, it is questionable whether or not there's like bias in it or what the quality is. Also, author credentials is important. Again, is this somebody who has the specific training and expertise in this field to be providing information about it? Or is this, again, just somebody that kind of, you know, read some articles online and is kind of putting information out there? Um, the timeliness of the publication. So are you relying on a research article or a review paper from, you know, 20 years ago um, versus is this a paper that's been published in the last five years? So you want to make sure you're getting the most up-to-date information on topic. And then references, um, identifying, you know, what articles, if it, you're looking at a review article, for instance, the references of that, what kind of primary literature played into that review and those recommendations? And is it complete or is it biased? Did it leave out anything important? So here is a really important uh, figure from our textbook, and this is um, demonstrating the three different types of literature categories. Um, at the top of our pyramid here, we have primary literature, and this consists of original literature, so like clinical trials, cost analyses, epidemiological studies, other observational studies. Then next step is secondary um, literature. And secondary literature consists of indexing or abstracting services. So these might be Medline, Scopus, Google Scholar, kind of databases where you might search for primary literature, for instance. Um, tertiary literature at the bottom of this pyramid is going to be more of a summary, more broader about existing medical literature. So whereas primary literature is going to be very focused and, and about a particular research study, the tertiary literature might be a collection or summary of many different pieces of primary literature. And so this um, common examples are clinical practice guidelines, reviews, textbooks, so forth. And the direction of our systematic approach actually goes from the bottom of the pyramid, starting with tertiary literature, all the way up to the primary literature. The first step, like I said, is searching in the tertiary literature. In tertiary literature, the condensed information um, is from primary sources, and it's organized in a format that facilitates efficiency. Ease of use and convenience are the key reasons tertiary resources are the first step to searching for information. Also, most are authored by experts, and information can be found using these resources without pursuing a secondary search. However, because tertiary literature is a condensed version of information from primary sources, it may be incomplete, and information may become outdated quickly, especially for textbooks. Bias and misinterpretation of research are also concerns with tertiary literature. These are some examples of secondary resources. Um, it, secondary resources act as an intermediary between primary and tertiary literature, and they directly link the researcher to both the original research articles and reviews. The most common format of secondary literature is an indexing or abstracting service, which is often referred to as a secondary database and is usually accessed electronically. So again, those are some examples, the PubMed, which we're going to get a lot of experience with, um, Medline. Uh, Scopus, so forth. Um, so secondary searching enables practitioners to retrieve comprehensive published medical literature specific to a topic. Um, some advantages are that many different sources for finding secondary literature are available. Most of these sources are available via the internet, um, which allows them to be continually updated. They're easy to use and timely. Depending on the scope of the request and the needs of the researcher, different resources may be preferred for a search, as well as searching multiple databases. Um, these, uh, each database may have unique features that can be great, greatly enhanced search strategies. Um, and so becoming familiar with these processes is important. Additionally, some of the secondary biomedical databases, they may require costly subscriptions. However, most that you'll be using in this course, but even as a practitioner, are available through the Wayne State Library and um, for free for students and alumni. And so this is, table here is kind of showing you some examples of guidance on how to efficiently search these secondary databases because they're going to contain a lot of information. And so um, review over this, but more of this information is covered in our um, Wendy Wu's presentations on searching PubMed, mesh searches, Boolean operators, and so forth. 
primary literature is the foundation on which all other literature sources are built. Primary literature is original research that can be published or unpublished work. Um, using primary literature is often the final step in the search for drug information because it's the most specific type of literature. And like I said, some of these might include clinical studies, so clinical trials, cohort studies, case controls, pharmacoeconomic studies, so describing and analyzing costs and consequences of drug therapy, pharmacoepidemiology, so looking at the impact of a drug therapy or clinical service on a large number of patients. Um, they can include professional meeting abstracts or proceedings, theses, and patents. The advantage of using primary literature includes the ability to obtain complete, detailed, and the most relevant information about a topic, and it allows the uh, researcher to independently evaluate the information. Disadvantages are that it requires the researcher to conduct a comprehensive search to obtain truly relevant research findings that are translatable to patient care. The information cycle or publication of medical literature can be a really long process. So in our first step, we have primary literature. Um, publication of this primary literature can take several months to a year, um, and that includes time from, you know, the initial review at the editorial level of a journal, peer review, editing, proofreading, and then finally publication. By the time an article becomes indexed into a secondary literature source can vary. Um, however, most secondary sources are updated frequently, so that could be daily, weekly, so you're usually getting the most up-to-date information. Um, the tertiary resource, um, the time it takes an article to be referenced in a tertiary um, resource can be longer due to the length of an additional publication process, especially for textbooks, which usually don't have a turnover um, faster than three to four years. However, with online tertiary sources, it's much easier to update these things, and that time has been cut down significantly. So there's a lot of information available on the internet. Some of it's good, some of it's not so good, and so it's really important that you understand the quality of the information that you're getting. So for instance, please do not use Wikipedia to find information to counsel your patients or make recommendations. And the re one primary reason for this is that there's a lack of expertise, so there's really no um, regulation on Wikipedia, anybody can post to it. There's limited or no peer review. So, you know, people put something up there and then it's up there. But nobody is actually validating whether, whether or not that information is accurate. Um, two freely available um, databases that I've mentioned before that are available to search for information would be Google Scholar and PubMed. And so this is much better at trying to identify high quality information using these search engines. Websites that end in .gov and .edu usually have higher, more dependable quality information versus .org or .com.